Hello, everybody. I hope everyone is having a great day. My name is Howard Berman, and I'm the CEO of Koya Therapeutics. We are a privately held company, and we're taking a revolutionary new approach to stopping neurodegenerative diseases in its tracks. And we have the clinical data to back this up in our first indication, ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and is commonly also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. So early last year, I was in a meeting serendipitously set up by a mutual colleague of mine to attend a closed door presentation with Dr. Stanley Appel about the research he was conducting at Houston Methodist. I didn't know Stan personally, but I'd heard about him. And his name is legendary in the field of ALS and neurodegeneration. He's considered the world's leading expert in the field. And it was a real privilege to be at that meeting. He walked me through a briefing of his research, including the findings to date. And what I saw really shocked me in his presentation. In the phase one trial, he had learned how to stop disease progression in ALS patients. And this is a notoriously degenerative disease that is refractory to all current treatments. I was so compelled by this that I quit my job at AbbVie soon thereafter. And together with him, I launched Koya Therapeutics to bring this therapy to the world. A bit about myself is that I graduated with a master's and a PhD in neuropharmacology from Weill Cornell Medical School. I spent my early career at MD Anderson in tech transfer and licensing. And I transitioned then to biopharma to Eli Lilly, Novartis, AbV. I worked at the time at Morphosis. And it was there that I learned how to launch drugs, develop drugs. And the most recent drugs I commercialized was Venetoclex for CLL, Tafacitumab for lymphoma. But the work that I'm doing at Koya is the most exciting with our regulatory T cell therapy. And this is such an important mission to me. I will not stop until this therapy is approved for patients. I'm joined by a leading C-suite team covering medical and research, as well as regulatory and manufacturing. And I think we have all the assets to make this happen. One of the most exciting things is I've recruited some of the top and leading thought leaders in the field, headed by Dr. Stan Appel, who is, at, as I mentioned, the world's leading expert in ALS, neurodegenerative diseases, and was dis the discoverer of Treg dysfunction in these disorders. Shimon Sakaguchi is a National Academy of Science member. He is the discoverer of regulatory T cells. And very excited and privileged to have him on our team. Larry Steinman is a National Academy of Science member as well. And Clive Svensson is one of the world's leading experts in stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. And Malcolm Brenner is uh, one of the leading cell therapy experts in the world. Most of you have had the misfortune of knowing someone and possibly even a family member who has a form of neurodegenerative disease. One of the worst of these diseases is ALS. This is a horrible, it's progressive disease. And what happens is it destroys muscle controlling nerve cells called motor neurons and eventually paralyzes the individual and ultimately the muscles used to breathe. All of this happens while the patient's mind, his, pers his personality, intelligence, memory remains intact. It's just a devastating disease. There are no meaningful treatments that are available. The ones that are approved measure success by only slightly reducing deterioration. And that's what we wanna change. We want to really provide a, not an incremental improvement to this, but we wanna provide an exponential. The clinical trial landscape is littered with many failures. And one of the key underlying features about the decline of patients is inflammation, both peripheral and neuroinflammation. Our lead therapy, which involves removing cells called regulatory T cells, which are not functioning properly from patients and converting them to highly functional regulatory T cells for a reinfusion back to the patient was developed by Stan Appel. And I believe that this is the most compelling development ever in the field. I mentioned that Dr. Appel is the 
father of modern ALS, and he discovered this strong correlation between dysfunctional T-Rex and ALS patient decline. And it was based on this discovery that a phase one trial was initiated and it showed something that had very rarely been seen before in prior studies or even treatments. Namely, that these infusions stop the progression of the disease on a dime. So what we've done since then is we've completed a phase two A trial that has introduced something new, which is maintenance monthly treatments, hopefully to maintain the durability of the halting of the progression of the disease. Our trial data will be unblinded and it will be presented this summer. And the key goal here is to illustrate safety as well as maintain the durability of response that we've seen in the phase one trial. Our goal is to make ALS no longer a death sentence, but a disease that can be stabilized and lived with, with good quality of life, as was done for HIV and AIDS. We are planning on numerous approaches to differentiate ourselves, including adaptive trial designs using novel biomarkers. And we are developing this therapy for other diseases orphan diseases that are based on dysfunctional Treg biology. So we are not just an ALS company. Some of our key investment highlights are we are able to prove, we have proven models of suppressing neuroinflammation, both preclinically and clinically. We have the first in class, the best in class, disruptive autologous Treg therapeutics model, and we are also developing exosomes, which are a derivative product from the T-Rex. Exosomes, you may know in some other companies that are developing, are a, an exploding field, which is really driven by the fact that they are not cells and can be delivered allogeneically. And we are planning a phase one trial in that, in the, in that, with that treatment as well. We are revolutionizing cell therapy manufacturing as well. One of the key areas in cell therapy is manufacturing and however good your product may be, if you don't have a scalable model to deliver the therapy to many, many patients, you will fall flat. And so we have taken an academic process and we have converted it from the academic process to a scalable automated system. We've introduced cryopreservation, which is very important because it allows us to deliver these cells to remote patient infusion centers for rethawing for maintenance therapies downstream for, the, for one year. And we have numerous value creation milestones that are set ahead. We have our phase two eight top line data that is coming out soon. We have manufacturing partnerships that are in development as well with additional IP enhancement. We are driving first in human trials in frontotemporal dementia and scleroderma, which are driven by T-Rex dysfunction. And again, we are going to launch our exosome phase one trial in 2022. So ALS has long been seen as a disease of motor neurons because those are the cells that die. And their death is what is it caused being causing the impairment of the movement and ultimately the death of the person. But one of the most critical things that have been has been discovered in the last 20 years is that the, de the decline of the patient and the spread of the disease is really a consequence of cells around the nerves, macrophages and microglial cells respond, how they respond to the dying motor neurons. It's an inflammatory process that is triggered and causes the disease to become debilitating and the patient's decline to start and rapidly increase. And as you see here, the images of the fires along the axon illustrate the worsening inflammation. And that ultimately begins to grow out of control and destroy the motor neurons. Much of the seminal work that is illustrated here in terms of the heightened inflammation in the periphery and inflammation was derived out of the laboratory and clinical work of Stan Appel. And the key finding was that regulatory T cells, which is a type of immune cell, become dysfunctional as well as lower in number in these patients. 
And the worse the, re the re regulatory T cell dysfunction, the worse the condition and the decline of the patient, as well as the survival. And this is one of the most important reasons that explains why Lou Gehrig on the left progressed quickly and died a few years post-diagnosis versus Stephen Hawking who lived and functioned with the disease for decades. The decline of ALS patients sees a dramatic reduction in regulatory T cell numbers and function. Tregs are very important cells in that they regulate and block many aspects of the inflammatory response. They act as a stop sign when the system is hyperreactive or overreactive and its dysfunction in ALS causes a chain reaction that results in dramatic inflammatory responses, which leads to damage and destruction of the motor neurons. So in ALS, the ratio of immune cells is dramatically in favor of the pro-inflammatory cell type on the left, as you see, as Tregs are no longer able to block the inflammatory cell types of M1, as well as Th1, Th17. Those are the effector T cells. And this is symbolic of the forest fire where inflammation is raging out of control. So ultimately, our therapy, which involves infusion of hundreds of millions of highly functional Tregs, as is shown in green here on the green cells, given back to the patient, shifts the ratio dramatically in favor of the anti-inflammatory cell types with the goal to stop the damage to the axon. When you measure the blood of a patient with fast progressing ALS, you find increased levels of M1 pro-inflammatory macrophages and pro-inflammatory T cells and cytokines. And most significantly is to decrease number and function of Tregs. It is the level of Treg dysfunction that correlates to how quickly and fast the patients die and the greater the burden of disease. And this study that you see here was done by Dr. Appel in a cohort of fast versus slow progressing patients. It's clear that Treg biology plays a seminal role in the progression of ALS. And intervention using our therapy and modality will hold an important role in modifying the disease. So what's the innovation here? What have we done? Dr. Appel learned how to remove the dysfunctional Tregs, which you see here in orange from the patient using apheresis or leukophoresis and repair them to a functional status showed by the green cells on the right. So in ALS, what happens is healthy Tregs become dysfunctional Tregs because of these bad inflammatory cells that are shown here by the M1s. And dysfunctional T-Rex cannot inhibit the effector T cells as well as they cannot inhibit the M1s. So it's a feedback cycle that occurs. And here we show that the dysfunctional T-Rex are removed from the patient. They are converted, they're expanded to billions of healthy T-Rex. And then the goal here is to change the inflammatory state in the body by reinfusion back to the patient. So with this in mind, we've conducted a phase one and a phase two A and that I'm gonna discuss those now. Our phase one trial using autologous Tregs for treatment of ALS was done in a very small cohort of three patients, a fast progressing patient, a medium progressing and a slow progressing. Patients underwent apheresis, the Tregs were isolated and expanded. And then we administered the Tregs at two time points, six months apart. This was not done on a maintenance basis like in the phase 2A trial. We can commonly administer interleukin-2 and we monitored the patients for biomarkers as well as safety, as well as the change in disease progression rates with ALS FRS scales. So the phase one trial, as I had mentioned early on in my talk was remarkable. It stopped progression on a dime. Here we show that this patient, number one, was declining in the time point before zero, which is the first infusion. And then the infusions were administered and the patient stopped progression. The problem was is that the, when the infusions stopped in the subsequent months, the patient started to decline again. We then reinfused in the second infusion period on the right, the patient stopped progression again on a dime. We knew that this was exciting, but we also knew that we needed a way to maintain the durability of the 
response. I'm gonna illustrate patient number two, which showed the same profile, patient declining, stop progression, patient started to decline again and stop progression. Same thing we saw in patient number three. And what was extremely exciting was that the biomarker, which we call a pharmacodynamic biomarker, is that in the infusions, which you see here, the two infusions, the Treg cell numbers increased pretty dramatically during the course of infusions over both infusions. And Treg suppressive function correlated and corresponded to the response. So now we had a biomarker that went up when we infused the cells and when we were not infusing the cells, the biomarkers dropped. This is very exciting. Also very exciting is that patients who typically and, and unfortunately die because of poor respiratory function stabilized their respiratory function during the Treg infusions as well. The bottom line is that we've learned a tremendous amount from the phase one trial, it, namely that Treg numbers increased during infusions. There was enhanced Treg suppressive function that correlated with func slowing of functional decline, respiratory function stabilized, patients stopped progression. And the infusions were proved to be safe with no major clinically significant changes in uh, laboratory findings, EKG, and so forth. Now, as exciting as our phase one trial what was, we realized that we needed to innovate our future trial developments. And if we were gonna stop progression and maintain their response for months or even years, we needed to figure out how to manufacture enough cells for a year and freeze them to allow for monthly infusions. This was a very challenging technological feat. And the main reason is that Treg are very unstable cell types and they cannot be They've previously not been able to be frozen and then uh, uh, thawed successfully. But we were successful and now we've been able to do something pretty remarkable. One manufacturing run can produce enough cells that are needed for the entire year of patient's treatment. So the flow is a patient will come in, undergo apheresis, we isolate the T-Rex and convert them to a highly functional state and we expand to the billions of cells. We aliquot the cells and ship them to the patient's infusion center for monthly infusions over the next 12 months. So the phase 2A leveraged this technology enhancement. Our goal was to reaffirm the groundbreaking results of the phase 1 trial and uh, show that the patients can stabilize and stop progression. This would be a dramatic and remarkable outcome, even in a subset of patients who could, we could show this as a, an outcome. So our phase 2A trial is in eight patients, six patients in the double blind who cross over to the open label. Patients in the open label undergo a dose escalation three to threefold the dose. And we're looking for changes in Treg suppressive function, changes in Treg numbers, safety, tolerability, the ALS FRS scores, uh, force vital capacity as well as proteomics and a number of other biomarkers that will inform us for the next trial. As I had mentioned, this trial is complete. Uh, we are awaiting the data, which we will release in the very near future. And we're very excited about that. Our next steps in ALS trial development is to take the data that we are going to show in from our phase two A, we're going to stratify with biomarkers that we've identified and enriched for. And this way we can really do what is done in oncology is to personalize medicine for those patients that will best respond to this Treg therapy. We're also considering combining our Treg cell therapy with combination therapeutics to suppress inflammation in conjunction. And we're looking at adaptive trial designs to conduct, for example, two arm trials that will then inform the clinical development strategy and potentially open up into a larger pivotal and registrational trial. So now I'd like to talk about our exosome technology because I really think that that is an exciting future for an allogeneic method for delivery. As I had mentioned, what we typically do right now is we expand the to billions of highly suppressive Tregs in our manufacturing approach for treatment for these neurodegenerative diseases. During the process by which we expand, 
We also collect in the media a huge number of, of uh, exosomes which we're able to concentrate and isolate. And it is this manufacturing process that allows us to produce enough exosomes, which are gazillions of exosomes that we can then utilize and leverage. These exosomes have tremendous neuroprotective and immunosuppressive effects. And this just illustrates what I just described. What is interesting is that every cell produces unique exosomes with unique characteristics and contents. For example, exosomes produced from cancer cells produce, can likely lead to more cancer. Exosomes produced from stem cells produce anti-inflammatory uh, type exosomes. So we are deriving our exosomes from the most potent anti-inflammatory cell type in the body, the regulatory T cell. And the main difference between our exosomes and the other leading companies in the field are that our Treg exosomes are magnitudes of order more immunosuppressive than others. And we have the data to support that. There has been a tremendous explosion in exosome biology and they're becoming very hot commodities in which companies are basing their entire approach around. About 10 years ago, they were relatively unknown and now you see them continuing to expand dramatically. Multiple companies have announced deals in excess of hundreds of millions of dollars. Biopharma has taken note with significant investment as well. And our differentiation as, as I had mentioned is that we are magnitudes of order more immunosuppressive uh, not just at lower doses, but at the same dose, we, uh, there is no comparison. We've also shown that our exosomes are highly stable over a long period of time. They can be stored at minus 20 degrees centigrade. And we can freeze and thaw the cells many times with no loss in viability or stability. We're going to focus our technology, not just on ALS, but in other diseases, which we've discovered in Treg dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease, in frontotemporal dementia. We just published a paper in Parkinson's disease, and we are expanding this to uh, both uh, scleroderma and other autoimmune conditions as well. So we are a template, a platform company, not just an ALS company. This indicates our treatment pipeline. Uh, while we only list three indications, we have others in mind. These are orphan indications which give us priority and we are extremely excited to move to our next indication in 2022, which is uh, frontotemporal dementia. We have a very strong IP portfolio which covers the wide array from manufacturing to expansion, uh, cryopreservation, and we also have composition of matter patents as well. Our Tregs have very unique profiles when we expand it that is not naturally occurring in nature. And our exosome platform similarly also has very unique IP uh, portfolio and landscape, and we are constantly developing these portfolios as well. We have taken an academic process and we have scaled that to an industrialized scalable process using modules. We are continuing to enhance and develop our CMC, and we are discussing and also moving into partnerships with CDMOs so that we can, we can be able to service large numbers of patients, both in a pivotal registrational trial as well as in commercialization. And just to finish off our key investment highlights, we believe we are the most potent neuroinflammation suppression method out there. Um, we use our autologous T-Rex, but we're also moving very quickly into allogeneic modalities using exosome biology. We have revolutionized cell therapy manufacturing in the T-Rex landscape. We're using proprietary manufacturing steps, and we have learned how to cryopreserve the cells. Again, I'm going to stress that that's very important, and that overcomes prior limitations of T-Rex cell therapies, which were only administered one time because they couldn't be frozen. We have numerous value creation points coming up. And I mentioned that those, each of these can be inflection points that are very exciting to investors as well as ourselves. Uh, we continue to innovate and we are committed to both our stakeholders and most importantly, our patients to 
to be able to deliver this therapy and hopefully provide significant benefit for the future and for their conditions. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and I wish you all well.